I will now entertain a motion to adopt the agenda. So moved. All right, we have a motion from Ms. Byers Bailey, a second from Ms. Sawyer. All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hands. And for those participating by telephone, if you could unmute yourselves. And Dr. Jones, how say you? Oh, yes. Ms. Cheek? Yes. And Ms. Ship? Yes. Thank you. Any opposed? All right, Madam Clerk, the agenda is adopted by a unanimous vote of nine to zero. Um, all right, let's move on to our action items. Um, we have one action item this evening, which is a proposal to modify in-person and remote instruction plan that this board approved on September 16th, 2020. Before the board acts, I'm going to turn to the superintendent to introduce this item and then to make a recommendation. Well, thank you and uh, good evening, Madam Chair and members of the Board of Education. Tonight, uh, the leadership team uh, here in CMS will bring forward a proposal for your consideration that increases the frequency with which our K-5 students will attend in-person instruction in our school facilities. Uh, we have said since Governor Cooper responded uh, to the pandemic uh, back in March um, by ordering schools closed to in-person instruction that our goal is to get students and staff back together in schools. And we have made it clear that our priority is to make that happen when it is safe to do so. From the beginning of planning for the 2020-2021 school year, we said that we would be both flexible and adaptive. And tonight, we will demonstrate those qualities. The plan our staff presented at the September 16th Board of Education meeting was based on the best information available uh, to us at that time. Less than 24 hours after that meeting, um, when you voted to enable CMS to begin a phased return to in-person instruction, the governor announced new guidelines pertinent to elementary schools or K-5 in particular. This revision uh, to the executive or order removes some of the barriers to returning students in kindergarten through fifth grade. And as a result, our leadership team has met with our principals and staff to determine opportunities to allow more frequent in-person learning for those students in grades K-5. And so I want to clearly state that our commitment to data-informed, metrics-driven approach to returning staff and students to our schools in person remains firm. We understand that the governor and state health and public instruction officials have an enabled districts statewide to return students in uh, grades K through five to in-person under plan A. But it made clear that such decisions are left to districts to make keeping staff and students health and safety in mind based on information each district must consider individually. And we also acknowledge that other districts in our area are making choices different than which we will present tonight for consideration. Those districts are not Charlotte Mecklenburg schools. Factors unique to CMS drive our deliberative approach to getting our students and staff back into our school buildings. We are focusing on and will continue to focus on doing what we do well and that is serving the educational needs of the most diverse student population in the state of North Carolina with the most dedicated group of teachers and support staff to be found anywhere. We take this responsibility of providing equity in education very seriously and 
we take just as seriously our duty to protect the health and well-being of staff, students, and families in our community. And so I am going to open our presentation up momentarily, but before I do that, I wanted to acknowledge that on this past Tuesday, September the 29th, we had uh, over 1,100 students served by our exceptional children's programs and staff members who provide instruction and support for these students return to in-person instruction in more than 80 of our schools. We thank our families for trusting Charlotte Mecklenburg schools to bring these students back safely and to provide educational opportunity. And I wanna also thank our teachers and staff for being the first back with students in person since March. And speaking of first, I must recognize the students and staff of Ray Farm STEAM Academy as they represent the first ever to in enter that new school for in-person instruction. And that was a significant milestone. And I summarize all of that by saying we demonstrated so far this week that our deliberative phased approach works. And so now, uh, before I turn it over uh, to Ms. Kathy Elling, I'm going to uh, begin by reviewing a few slides. And so I want to start by talking about our objectives for this evening. We have two objectives for this evening. One is to share a potential revision to the phased in elementary return to in-person instruction. And the second objective is to share implications of a revised plan for instruction, public health, safety, and district and school level operations. Again, as a review, the local context. In this particular slide, you will see the three plan options you'll see the public health scenarios and the back to school scenarios. There are also some key dates on this slide and I just wanted to refresh everyone's memory. On July 14th, the governor declared that K-12 public schools in North Carolina would open under plan B. Just over two weeks later on July 30th, CMS Board of Education voted to begin the school year in plan C which the governor provided flexibility to do so. And just on September the 16th, the Board of Education approved a plan to transition uh, to plan B for our pre-K 12 students. The very next day, as I mentioned earlier, the governor announced elementary schools may open in plan A. And then on slide four, Again, just a reminder of the time frame in which students uh, are, are, will be returning back for in-person instruction. And uh, you'll note that um, on September 29th, our pre-K teachers return and our pre-K students um, will return on October the 12th. And you'll see other groups, our elementary school students, November the 2nd, um, and then also other middle followed by middle and high school. And so with that, I'm going to uh, toss it over to Kathy Elling, our chief school performance officer, to talk about our dashboard and our public health metrics. Good evening. Uh, thank you, uh, Superintendent Winston, as a reminder as well um, as a part of the review. At the forefront of our decision making about who's in school and with the frequency of when kids are in school has been driven by our governor's um, orders, North Carolina public health um, information and our own metrics and dashboard. To that end, I wanna remind you that we're looking at positivity rate in our community and cases per 100,000. You will recall that the dashboard specifies how to bring kids back for in-person learning based on the status of these two critical community health metrics. If both metrics are green for greater than 14 days, our guidelines were to consider in-person learning at all schools. Both yellow and none in the red for four, greater than 14 days, we were to consider in-person learning for only prioritized student populations. And then if one or more in red, it might signal that we need to consider remote instruction. 
So I want to share with you the public health metrics currently, um, and this is the top of the dashboard that looks, uh, you should look familiar. <coughs> I want to share our current case counts in Mecklenburg County right now are 66 out of 100,000 uh, cases, which is the, puts us in the yellow, and the current positivity rate for the seven-day average is 6.5. So those metrics support our um, plan that was approved on the 16th, and you're gonna hear us talk about a, a revision to that plan that still meets the metrics guidelines and is allowable um, per the governor's orders. And at this time, I'll let uh, Dr. Matt Hayes come up, and he's gonna walk us through the elementary plan. Thank you, Ms. Selling. We appreciate that. So we'll go ahead and move into the revised K-5 in-person instructional plan. So uh, although, as uh, Kathy Elling just mentioned a few minutes ago, um, governor, our governor moved to plan A for grades K-5 statewide, uh, which allows us more students to be in, in person daily. Uh, local health metrics are in yellow, uh, which allows us, indicates that specific prioritized students should attend in-person instruction at this time. And CMS has revised the elementary plan to prioritize large groups of K-5 students attending in-person learning with more frequency. Though the governor uh, has moved us with K-5 to the option of Plan A, I will state that this, and although this relaxes some of the social distancing requirements, CMS remains committed uh, to the safety of all of our students and staff. That is our number one priority uh, above anything else. We will still continue to monitor and respond to our dashboard. As time uh, moves forward, we would uh, require students and staff to wear face coverings. Uh, I want to make sure that I'm clearly emphasizing that that is a non-negotiable. That is a non-negotiable for us. And that we will also emphasize frequent and proper hand washing. We will observe social distancing to the extent possible. And we will practice enhanced cleaning and hygiene procedures. So the revised K-5 in-person instructional plan, the goal here was to increase the number of students in the school for in-person learning at any given time and to increase the frequency in which individual students attend in person. This is our recommendation. It's to collapse attendance group C into groups A and B, creating two attendance groups in grades K-5 only. Modify the rotation such that students in attendance group A attend in person for uh, during all of our Mondays and Tuesdays, and attendance group B attends in person on all of our Thursdays and Fridays, and that is on a weekly basis. Wednesdays would be remote learning days for all students, whether they are in group A or in group B. School-based staff will continue to report on Wednesdays. Elementary school elementary students begin reporting on November the 2nd. There is no change. There's no change to what was approved on the 16th for the November the 2nd. Elementary teachers will also uh, report on October the 19th. Once again, this was approved on the September the 16th and will not change as well. I want to point out just quickly that as we met with our principals and we discussed uh, this opportunity in front of them and the collapsing of C. One of the key things that they mentioned to us was that in order for our schools, uh, transportation, and also for our staff, especially our staff, to be able to pivot on the request, the ask is that we maintain the November 2nd uh, date. So that is what we have done. And weekly cadence for reviewing the metrics in both subsequent phases does not change either. So this is what the plan, the revised plan would look like. This is an example. On October the 19th, the teachers will return, once again, as also approved on the 16th. On November the 2nd and beyond, on Monday and Tuesday, you see that Group A will report. On Wednesday, it is an A-B remote, and we'll get into a few minutes about how we will utilize that Wednesday for benefit students and also our teachers. And on Thursday and Friday, Group B will attend, and this is for November the 2nd and beyond. 
So the full remote academy, just to make sure that we are very clear, the full remote academy does not change. It still remains uh, in the same procedures that was established when it was established and also that were approved on the 16th of September. Uh, the request for transfer will take place. Uh, that needs to be into the schools on, by December the 4th. If individuals are wishing to move into the full remote academy or to move out of the, the full remote academy for second semester. Requests for transfers because we do understand that families' lives change and we also have to uh, have a process for when these things occur. Uh, there are several factors here that, uh, was that were also approved on the 16th of September uh, that we also want to make sure that our, uh, we revisit. And you see those that are listed here uh, for consideration at the school level uh, once any of these are met. So let's talk for just a few minutes about a couple of school examples. Uh, if they would, if we, when we collapse C into A and B. So for example, right now we have uh, four, our four remote academy uh, is an average of anywhere between 12% to 53% in our elementary schools across the district. Uh, we are working with each principal to assess the implications of AB groupings in class size and in schedules. What I want to uh, bring forward at this point in time is if you look at these, these are two schools, Governor's Village and Valentine, both that have a, high, a higher percentage of students in the full remote academy. Both of these schools, uh, when speaking to the leadership, stated that they could uh, collapse into the AB grouping and that they also, at the same time, because of a higher percentage of full remote academy students, would also be able to observe the six foot distancing. Here you have two other schools, two other elementary schools that have a lower percentage of students in the full remote academy. In one school, you'll see that um, they are still able to, in collapsing into A and B, are able to uh, still maintain the six foot social distancing. But in another school, you see that they are not able to do exactly six feet. Uh, let's, I just wanna be very clear in the purpose that what that means to all of us is the fact that all of our schools are not built uh, identical. Uh, rooms are different sizes, buildings are different sizes, and because of that, uh, it will, all of that will have to take, be taken into consideration around that, um, the distancing piece. So implications of the revised elementary plan. So instructional implications. The main thing here, which I wanna lift up to everyone and make sure it's very clear, is this increases the frequency of in-person instruction for all K-5 students not enrolled in the full remote on a weekly basis. To us, that's key. This is an opportunity for a more rapid response to assist students, provide materials and troubleshoot technology for all of our students in the K-5 uh, uh, elementary schools. Remote Wednesdays represent an opportunity for teachers as well as students. Teachers can engage with students as needed to provide small group instruction, interventions, and specialized services for students. It also allows our teachers to engage in professional learning communities and professional development to promote teacher growth and effectiveness. This was something that was uh, brought to us clearly by STAC, which is, uh, the, principal, which is the superintendent's advisory board from uh, the teachers across our district. It also was something that was brought forward to us by our teachers and also by our principals in support of their teachers if we were to collapse into a uh, A-B scenario. Wednesday will be a full instructional day with remote uh, learning in mostly all asynchronous settings except for small groups that may need to be pulled. And students, I'm sorry. sorry, I need to move me real quick, excuse me. Yes. Sorry about that, we're working out a technical glitch here. I promise I know how to use a clicker. <laughs> I think we're on 16. Excellent. Okay, so let's go back. Uh, we'll pick up what we said on Wednesdays will be full instructional days uh, for remote learning um, in most in asynchronous setting, except for the small groups that would possibly be pulled by teachers. And then students may experience schedule changes, including teacher assignments. Now, I want to be clear here and, and, and pause for just a second and make sure that, that everyone is clear on this. We've uh, had some conversations with many of our principals. Our principals will try to avoid this as much as possible uh, in, in which they have to make schedule changes uh, with as far as the teacher that is currently with the student. But we're, we definitely also wanna make sure that it is very clear 
um, that that is not something that can be avoided in all situations. Uh, it will be to the best of the ability of all of our principals and their staff as they uh, schedule and collapse C into A and B and begin the more frequency of students attending in person, but just want to make sure that that's, uh, that that's out there as well. And that would, have to, that would have to happen at any point in time that we return students back to school in person. So just want to make sure that that's clear with everybody and especially uh, our audiences uh, and our families that are out there in our communities. So expectations for uh, balancing synchronous and asynchronous instruction as well as for the amount of screen time will remain consistent with guidance provided. That guidance was uh, reissued um, this about a week and a half ago uh, just so everybody can get level set on that across the district. So safety and health implications of revised plan is increasing the frequency of students experience and in in-person instruction also increases the number of students attending the school at any given day. This implies that we may uh, have to look at a reduced or eliminating social distancing on buses and also in some of our classrooms. Social distancing in classrooms, uh, we will still try to once again uh, stay at that six foot as we uh, talked to some of our principals and they were able to establish that they would still be able to do that. But this will also once again depend on uh, students attending in person, school staffing, uh, and also the setups of the classrooms and the building itself. Required safety and public health uh, precautions will remain in place. They will remain in place. Uh, maintain our focus on the three W's, which is wear, which is wear a mask, uh, wait and give distance. Uh, and wash our hands with a particular emphasis on wearing face coverings. Once again, I'm going to restate, uh, face coverings are not an option. They are not an option in, our, in the schools. Cohorting students uh, to the greatest of extent possible as we met uh, with some of our public health officials. One of the things uh, that they had recommended is that we make sure that um, we have students in elementary school that have a lot of specials that happen during the day. Uh, and one of the recommend recommendations, not mandates that they made or that they asked of us, was that uh, instead of having students out in the hallways and transitioning from one, to a, one, room, one room to another, that we would actually allow for those specials to actually come to the room itself which I thought was a brilliant idea. Um, and so we will uh, figure out how to make that happen. Uh, so large areas like gymnasiums won't be used necessarily uh, for PE or physical education, but what we will use them, what we can use them for is uh, various instructional purposes and so forth uh, throughout the course of the day. So they still will be used and that will be at the discretion of the principal as the leader of the building. And students may uh, also play outside, uh, but we are asking at this point in time that students are not actually on the playground equipment. So operational uh, implications, enhanced cleaning will take place in the elementary schools on those Wednesdays in between Group A and Group B. Uh, CMS Eats at Home uh, deliveries will need to stop on October the 23rd in preparation uh, for the return of students on the November the 2nd date. After school enrichment program will offer full day programming on the Wednesdays uh, with priority given to the students that are registered before and after school care and accommodations will be made for all other students as space is available. And then the full day support of children of staff will continue to be provided uh, for K-5 students during the remote day learning days, including Wednesdays as approved on the 16th of September. And ASEP, just to make sure everyone understands, that's our after school enrichment program. So at this point in time, I will uh, turn it back over to Superintendent Winston. Uh, thank you for uh, your time and your grace. Thank you, Dr. Hayes. Madam Chair, uh, this uh, represents my recommendation informed by staff's best thinking uh, to increase the frequency of in-person instruction for our students in grades K through five. All right. Um, well, before I go to the motion, um, I will ask any board members if you have any questions. Um, and I'm going to start with the board members who've joined us remotely. I hope that you're hearing us okay now. I understand there was a while there where you could not hear us. And, um, and for that time, I hope you were able to read along with the, um, the, with the package, um, the PowerPoint. Um, but I will start with... Dr. Jones, do you have any questions? And if you could unmute yourself. All right. Not at this point. Not at this point, okay. Um, Ms. Cheek, do you have any questions? My only question would be, is there a 
weekly or bi-weekly review to see where things stand so that there is any, you know, in, or any plan target in place for moving to a full plan A as the governor's um, recommendation allows for elementary K-5 or even for the younger students just um, or phasing it back in smaller groups of, you know, K-2 and then a 3-5. Yes, thank you, Ms. Cheek. So the review cycle is weekly against the metrics. So we're assessing progress every week against the metrics in preparation for the next phase. So I believe on the plan that you um, approved on the 16th, we, we provided a three-week interval. Um, if we can get 14 days, the metric says 14 days in a certain status would allow us to increase in-person instruction or could perhaps require us to consider remote instruction. So it would be minimally data reviewed every week, um, and then we would consider benchmarking against both the plan that you previously approved and the cycle of metrics over a two-week period. That's great. So is there any indication that by going to the, two, the, the AD rotation for elementary, does that make it uh, it, uh, easier or does that pose any different challenges if we wanted to pivot into plan A? That, that, is, a, that is a great question. So actually um, what it does is by being in two groups of, of A and B at a 50% and the higher frequency of attending weekly um, for our schools and their scheduling purposes, uh, it would make it easier at this point in time if that transition has to come because it reduces the amount of uh, schedule changes that would have to take place. It would just be a collapsing of those two groups into a solid week. Thank you so much for that information. That's all I have for now. Okay. Um, Ms. Ship, do you have any questions at this point? Uh, no, I don't have anything at this point. All right. Um, now I'm going to go from my right to my left. So, Mr. Shul, do you have any questions? I do have one question. Um, so, my understanding is correct that originally, um, before school started, the choice that we gave to parents was either a one by three rotational plan B or the full remote academy. So now that we're offering a slightly revised plan B, um, is there going to be any change in the application process to transfer out of full remote academy besides like things like sudden changes in finances or medical situation? Thank you, uh, Gabe. Actually, when we when we were first looking at that, one of the key things that we were looking at there was either to be in a uh, in a full remote opportunity or to return to in person instruction uh, when the school uh, when the district decides to do that. Now, um, at that point in time, what we set forward was that we would be in that full remote until the end of the semester, where you you then at that point in time could either opt in or opt out. Opt out. Right now, what is critical of why we were not able to move the date up. Uh, any sooner was due to the fact of, which is a great question because like I said, it, we don't just flip a switch, like a light switch and, and everybody comes back and uh, schedules work perfectly and transportation works perfectly and everything else. We got to give the district an opportunity collapsing that one into the other two. Uh, that's going to require us to make sure that uh, schedules are, are checked and, and properly students are properly placed in classrooms with teachers. Uh, but also it allows the time for our um, transportation team to reissue the routes. Uh, those have to be, um, first they have to be generated, uh, then you got to print them, then we got to mail them out and, and so forth and make sure that we got that contact. Because the one thing that we don't want to have happen as we bring students back to school, uh, and this is a concern with us whether we were here or every school year at the beginning of the year, we want to make sure that everyone knows when it's their time to be at the bus stop. Uh, so we can properly pick them up uh, with the minimum amount of time that they have to be there. That makes sense. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Strain. Thank you very much. So I do have a couple of questions. Uh, I'm going to start with just an acknowledgement um, that Ms. Helling spoke about the routine reviews of the, the numbers, the conditions, et cetera, on a weekly basis and, and being able to um, pivot as required to optimize our educational services given whatever those conditions are. And by optimize, that could be moving either direction, right? So, so where we are now, um, we're in a position where staff is bringing forward a plan, uh, a, a plan revision. And I don't believe there were any restrictions as to what could be revised when you brought it back. You could have brought a completely different plan 
you could have updated any part of this plan. So I have two different areas I'd like to explore. And in looking at those areas of the plan for potential revision, uh, obviously what we're doing on a routine basis is a risk benef benefit analysis. Uh, I think we have to acknowledge that all of us, I believe, believe that students are best served with in-school instruction, in-classroom, in-person instruction. And so from that perspective, the first area I'd, looked at, oh, I, I'd like to look at is actually plan A, to think about the risk benefit analysis that you've done between the risk associated with moving to a full plan A, as many, many of uh, the counties around us have decided through the risk benefit analysis of what you've suggested versus a plan A. So I would, I guess I would start by saying our stance in, in development of any plan was where are we as in community metrics, community health metrics. So our community health metrics drive the discussion that while the state metrics clearly gave the governor comfort to put it in a plan A, that a plan A for Mecklenburg County based on where we were, where we are is not the plan that we felt comfortable putting forward. Okay, so the, at, at last count, we were actually 66. There were 65 of the 100 counties which were actually having uh, a higher prevalence of disease in their communities than, than we do. Mm -hmm. And so 29 of those had already started on August 17th for in-school instruction. And of course, those have accumulated some numbers of clusters. I think at last count, it's eight. Um, but so, yes, there's that, right? There's the, there's that's on the risk side. Um, eight clusters of 630,000 people in schools. But if I look at our own dashboard that was put together, I think we're in yellow. Mm -hmm. And yellow says that we are able to entertain in-person learning for specified, or sorry, specific prioritized student populations in co collaboration with Mecklenburg County Public Health. So I would say K-5 would fit that description mm -hmm. as a specific prioritized student population. So again, I, I think we're within the bounds that we've set. So given some sort of incremental risk associated with plan A, which I'm not sure we've quite articulated. Are there benefits to plan A over what's been proposed here in terms of two days a week of our in-school participants, students? In theory, are you asking me if there's benefits to every child being in school every day, all day? Yes. The answer is of course. So there's benefits to there's being a, the, in school. There are benefits to full in-person instruction. Okay, so that would be 150% more in-school instruction if we moved from two days a week to five days a week, right? You're doing the math, so I can yes. yeah, it's, trust it's, you. I it's trust your math. Five days, so <laughs> okay, that would be 150% more. Uh huh. So I'm wondering about this risk-benefit analysis, right? So you all could have brought either of these plans. Mm -hmm. Can you walk me through this risk benefit analysis? There's additional risk of exposure, clearly, and there's additional benefit of in school instruction. Mm -hmm. I'm asking for the analysis that suggests that we're making this decision in the best interest of students. So, the analysis I would offer is that our county health metrics do not position us in a place where we would feel that it would be appropriate to bring everyone back because we cannot guarantee strict social distancing um, in all of our situations, and particularly on our buses, which we would open up to have um, many more students on buses than we previously were in the Plan B. I would also say that in consulting with our county um, health officials, um, they offered that any considerations about reopening or expanding um, to reopening, we consider both the benefits, like you said, and the risks of those actions. And the health department continues to prioritize as a prioritize helping um, 
emphasizing the community the importance of in-person instruction and in opening schools. However, based on the uh, information provided in the current COVID conditions in our community, they supported the plan that we put forward, or, or, or well, they obviously supported the plan that you all approved on the 16th, and we're here tonight to talk about a 50-50 a input for elementary age students. The risks are related to the decreased ability to ensure social distancing in classrooms and on school buses, and we continue to work closely. They're continuing to be our partners to assess conditions, as I referenced, when, uh, weekly and over a 14-day period. Um, and that's that's the recommendation that they they provided to us as a part of the plan development that we're talking to you tonight. So I just want to play that back and make sure I understood it correctly. So I think that boils down to Gibby Harris and Dr. Sullivan told us that they would not recommend that we go to plan A. Or did you say we put this plan in front of them and they said, yes, that's okay. Did we ever talk to them about Plan in A? In all conversations that we've had with um, our county health partners, the emphasis was on establishing conditions for safe operations of schools that included social distancing um, as a key factor, um, along with being able to uh, transport kids safely. And so the, the recommendation that we are the plan that we are sharing represents the, the thinking of, of our group and in consultation with them. Okay, so if social distancing is a key tenant, then they have in fact said that until there is an eradication of the disease, presumably, we can't go to plan A. I, I, won't, I, can't, I, I don't know that that's a fair assessment of their approach. Okay, has there been any discussion about the metrics at which they would support Plan A given all of the benefits, for example, of 150% more in school instruction? I, I think the benefits, what they would point us to is a continuing downward trend of both case positivity uh, and the number of cases in the county. Okay, so for the last month and a half, it's been low and stable. Those are the words that mm -hmm. Gibby Harris uses, as you know. And so she wants it lower and more stable, I guess. I think that's a fair assessment. Okay. Okay. I haven't so seen a me, statement as such okay, from, yep. the, from the health department, but I, I trust you guys are working with them. So. We definitely are. And so let me, let me be clear in, in some of the other, because I, I want to make sure that it's... Um, we had a conversation with many of our principals and also with our teachers. Um, and one thing that was very clear is that uh, no, one, no one has a, a plan, a playbook, uh, for how to operate underneath these circumstances. Uh, once again, I'm gonna state that safety is our number one uh, factor here that we will all take, always take in consideration. Um, and so looking at this plan, yes, there's the health metrics. That's, a, that's, a, that's one component of it. Uh, a major component of that is speaking to the educators uh, that have spent many, many years in, in school and learning how to be the strong practitioners that they are in running their buildings uh, and utilizing space and so forth. And those individuals have said to us, collapsing C into A and B and then doing a 50-50, that's, that's reasonable. They see that it is uh, in the right and the best interest of all kids for the learning and also gives us the greatest opportunity in which to continue to move forward to what you would consider to be in an A type setting, uh, but in a reasonable and responsible way. So I just wanna be clear in that that is, at the end of the day, the metrics and everything that we're talking about with the health end of it, that's one thing, but we've got folks, we've got people in this district that are brilliant individuals that have, that their whole, their whole life has been preparing themselves to educate our kids. And, and if I turn away from the leadership of a principal and say uh, that I don't listen to them, that would be irresponsible for me as a leader in this district. And so that is, that is I will hang my hat on those individuals uh, faster than anybody else because I know that at the end of the day, their hearts are about those kids that are in their schools. So I'll play it back again. I think what you just said was staff and our leadership in the schools 
would recommend against plan A. They're not comfortable with moving forward with a plan A at this point. Well, if, if I could just restate what I thought I heard, Dr. Hayes, is that in consultation with our members of our medical community and in listening um, and working closely with our staff, our building level leaders, um, what we have presented tonight is our best thinking. Uh, and this is what our proposal is for the board for approval. I understand that. And Mr. Superintendent, what I'm trying to get at is the risk benefit analysis that led there because you've brought us one plan. So I need to understand how you got to that one plan. Okay. So um, with respect, we don't talk at all about the risk and damage being done when kids are not in school, which we've been told time and time and time again by public health officials at every level, by our medical partners here in the region, that that is more substantial incrementally than the risk of having kids in the classrooms during COVID. So just want to make that clear as well. There's risk associated and in fact danger associated with not having kids in the classrooms. We, we tend to skip over that part. The other question I had was about the timing. So certainly again, in revisiting this plan, there was an opportunity to pull forward the timing. And so similarly with regards to the risk benefit analysis, can you walk me through say an October 19th versus a November 2nd start of, of kindergarten? Yeah. Uh, sorry, K-5 elementary sure. schools. Yeah, so as, as I stated in the, in the, in the, in the presentation that we uh, gave, uh, that there were other dates that were that we looked at and, and one of the things that was lifted up to us by our teachers and also by our principals was that in order to make the necessary changes and collapsing of C into A and B, which is uh, when you look at schedules that are developed for our students, that usually happens over the two and a half months that we have during the summer. It usually starts in, the, in March of the year before. Uh, please understand that we have asked them already twice to change those. This is the third time that they will have conducted that change. It is not a flipping of a switch, it takes time. Uh, on top of that, we also in collapsing C into A and B in order to increase frequency, you also have to make sure that our students uh, and our families are adequately prepared and given uh, acknowledgement of what uh, rotation they will be in and also to make sure that our transportation has the time to develop those, uh, not only the routes with those students, but also that we can get those mailings out. We will. Uh, we, we would love to be able to just shoot emails to everybody, but, but unfortunately we're not able to do that, nor do we feel that that's a confident way of handling it. We want to make sure that we mail those as well as send emails and connect eds in every other way. Uh, that time uh, moving into the second allows us to do that. It also provides on the 19th, as you see here, for teachers to enter the building. We, uh, first of all, we promised teachers or we, uh, it, the vote on September the 16th was uh, forced teachers to make, return on October the 19th. Uh, those families have had opportunities or, and uh, they've made arrangements uh, based off of that. I think it's irresponsible if we turn around and say, well, we've told you one thing and now we're going to flip it on you and do something different. So uh, we're going to stick to that on the 19th. Teachers come back into the building. That gives them the uh, adequate time to set their buildings up, go through the process that they need to make sure that they're going through uh, with their uh, administration uh, to in preparation to receive students back on an A day, B day, uh, and uh, twice a week, uh, every week with that frequency. And um, I want to keep this meeting moving along. I acknowledge I did not set out an expectation of a time limit for each line of questioning. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and turn to Ms. Delahara. But at uh, the end of this, Mr. Strain, if you have more questions, we'll come back to you. Sorry, can I just finish up? I mean, I had the floor. Uh, you didn't set. It's true. How many more questions do you have? This is on, this is on the last question. The last question. That, that's, this that's is the last October question, 19th versus November 2nd. This is the question associated with the dates. Okay, last question. Oh, it's the last discussion point really is October is the dates. So, um, so I understand Dr. Hayes in terms of the preparation, is there any benefit to pulling it back? So there's a bunch of reasons there that it would be perhaps advantageous to keep it where it is. Is there a benefit to pulling it forward? After speaking with the leadership of the buildings and the teachers that are teaching those classrooms, it would be irresponsible us to do that. Okay, so I'm just gonna share a quick story. I spent uh, an hour and a half today 
um, at a, a wonderful facility, community um, learning facility, remote learning facility that's been set up. It's been set up in the shadow of Panther Stadium and is hosting 100 McKinney, McKinney Vento kids. Every day CMS buses and some parents drop off 100 kids and they do their rem remote learning there. That's 100 McKinney Vento kids. They've got all the wraparound services. It is a fantastic operation that the Steve Smith Family Foundation has set up in partnership with ourselves. And it's amazing for those kids. Do we happen to have a count of McKinney Vento kids? Because that's 100 in that facility. I, I seem to remember it's something like 4,500. So the point is there's tremendous benefit in terms of every day. Every day matters for every one of our kids. And so I understand that there are disadvantages to pulling it forward. I can promise you there's advantages as well. With that, I'll yield. All right. Um, Ms. Delahara, and with the rest of our board members, I'm just acknowledging I did not set out a time limit, but if we could just use some restraint and just, you know, be efficient with your sure. time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to clarify because I, I, I sort of missed it at the beginning. Uh, Ms. Elling, did you say that our latest count was um, percentage of infection rate was 6.5 percent? Okay. And was that numbers for today or yesterday? I usually try to look on Fridays, but I, I just wanted to make sure I was clear on the latest data. I, I got these uh, late today, so I believe that count is as official as of yesterday. As of yesterday. Okay. Okay. That's interesting because that, um, that has gone up. And I guess I just, a few comments and then I'll make a, a question um, because we, we mentioned the yellow and what that means for the prioritization of certain groups. And I just want to state that, in fact, I do think that is what we've done. Uh, we prioritize with bringing folks in, on, uh, students, I should say, on Tuesday, and now we are prioritizing with bringing in pre-K, and then the next step is the prioritization with our K-5. Um, so it looks like we're right on target with the plans that we've moved forward. Um, I. I'm happy to hear that you are asking your education professionals what their opinion is, Dr. Hayes, because while I do, I'm glad that we're consulting with Metropolitan Berry County Health, and I do understand that Ms. Harris has made certain comments that we've been um, low and steady. You know, on September 9th, she also said that schoolhouses can be pig petri dishes. And I don't fault her for saying that. That sometimes is possible. <laughs> it's kind of the reality. We all grew up kind of hearing that. And so, so I think that it is important um, that we not necessarily look to them to be setting the standard to say, hey, this is when you should go back to school. Because they're not education professionals in the way that Dr. Hayes tonight has described that he went to his principals and said, or maybe you did, and said, what is the feedback that we need to get? And, uh, and they said, November 2nd is that best day that we can do it the most safely. Because of course there's always risk, right? There are risk every day. I have two kids of my own. I want nothing more than for them to be back in school for their academic and their mental health. But I also want them to be safe. And I'm glad that we're putting safety first and that your education professionals have established that November 2nd is that date. So with that in mind, um, as we are now going to hopefully move forward with dividing up into the two groups, just for the public standpoint, and I know the principals have to get to work to collapse these groups, but is there any kind of expectation of when parents might know if they were in group C? when they will now be in group A or B, not trying to you know, have this figured out by tomorrow or anything, but I just thought I would ask in case we have an indication of that. We don't, we don't have a clear indication of that at this point in time, just because like I said before, with each building, space utilization and so forth, they're gonna have to dig into that a little bit. I would anticipate within probably about a, uh, in around two, two and a half weeks, we should be able to definitely have that clear communication. Um, but once again, just wanna restate that our principles are set date, our principals, and especially our elementary principals, they they are just a special breed. I mean, they are so phenomenal. They uh, one of the key things there is that they talk about the relationships that students make with their teachers early on, and how they've invested in our students. We are blessed in this county, unlike many other counties across our state, 
that we have uh, the one-to-one -one opportunity, right? That we have devices that we can give out. We have the resources because of our community partners uh, to provide Wi-Fi services and do things that in other counties, they're having to change and, and, and really force themselves back into a setting that they may not be ready for because their students don't have that accessibility that we do. And, and so um, I just wanna, you know, our, our principals and our educators are, are using all of that to make sure that they, the be to the best of their ability, that they maintain the relationship with those students and they maintain those classes. So uh, I would say probably in, in around two week time period, mm -hmm. uh, we do have, we already have the numbers uh, on, on, on rough numbers on how that might look, but we've got, all that's gotta get plugged in to the system uh, for us to be able to accurately answer that question question uh, and also for us to generate many of the other reports that we need to have in which to move forward. <laughs> Thank you. That's great to help set an expectation. And just to be clear, this will not be for k eight grades six through eight. I just think it's good to the public that we clarify that. Yes, ma'am, that is correct. Uh, we, if, if there's a, we're working with our uh, principals right now that may be of a Montessori school that may have sixth graders in that school, and we're talking with them about how we can uh, manage through that, but it is in our K-8s, it would only be for our K-5 students, that is correct. Okay, and one last quick question. Um, I, I, I got um, in anticipation of tonight some feedback today from some parents who liked this plan. A couple parents did ask about, well, why don't, why didn't you just stick to week A, week B, week A, week B. And I'm just wondering what I could share with them on why this was chosen instead, uh, just a quick snippet. And you kind of covered that before, but just to clarify how I can help them to understand why this was more effective uh, from the, your, your, your staff's point of view. Yes, ma'am, and, and just, to, just to make sure everyone knows that this was actually something that was considered back in June when we started looking at this, and it was also something that was uh, considered uh, recently as we were looking at the, the plan that we brought to you. Underneath the, the uh, regulations and guidance that we had at that point in time by the governor, we weren't able to execute on it. Uh, we are now because of, of his what he uh, produced for us on the 17th. Um, so. What this allows us to do is it increases the frequency of students to be in person. That frequency is key because instead of a student, if for some reason, unless, you know, we've got a first grader or a kindergartner or whoever that's doing some work uh, with their families at home, a third grader or whatever, if all of a sudden the computer doesn't, is, has glitches in it um, or the, the Wi-Fi systems at home isn't working, now they have a touch point in their school with their teachers on a weekly basis to get the resources they need in a more timely fashion to get back up and running in the instructional setting. Uh, if they, for some reason, Wi-Fi becomes an issue or whatever, we can give them print materials, we can do different things, uh, but at least they have that weekly touch point. And for us, that was key, that frequency of being able to see students on a week-to-week -week basis. Great, I think that makes a lot of sense. Thank you, Dr. Hayes. Yes, ma'am, and plus also they, and sorry, but they also have uh, also in person all the other resources of nurses and social workers and so forth that are in the schools as well. That's another touch point that instead of having to do that in a virtual platform, they now will actually be able to have that in person as well. Thank you. Okay. All right, Ms. Byers Bailey. Thank you. Um, I have just a couple of questions. First, you mentioned that the masks for our K-5 students are non-negotiable. And that's because some of the schools, while some of the schools will be, be able to continue with social distancing, there are some schools that will not be able to social distance and the health and safety of those students as well as the faculty are heavily reliant upon the masks. Is that correct? So I'll let Ms. Kath Ellen come up in just a second. I, I'll, only thing I will say to that is a former uh, elementary school teacher who then was a high school principal at, la uh, at a later date, I will tell you that when those students get off that bus, you can tell them all day long, six foot distancing, 10 foot distancing, whatever you want to, uh, they're gonna get a little bit closer. The one thing that we know that we can do above anything else that helps uh, uh, reduce the opportunity of spread is wearing one of these. And so that is the key piece for us is that we have to mandate that for the safety of all students in our school and also our staff. And based on that, my next question is, if little Johnny jumps off the bus and says, I don't have to wear that mask because it's my right, yeah. does, are you gonna be calling Johnny's mama to tell him to come get him? So let me, can I back up just a second? Because not only is it from a public health standpoint a good idea, it's actually a part of the guidance that the state issued that it's a requirement 
unless there's a significant reason why a student would have um, would not be appropriate for them to wear a mask. So certainly, I think we. In, uh, if we have a student who is choosing not to, I really, I really do want to have a conversation with the parent because I want to make sure they understand the um, the benefit. And I think there's some proactive communication we can do around the fact that wearing a face covering protects you, protects others, and it keeps the germs where they belong. And so. We would definitely want to talk to parents and, and, and address any concerns that they may have relative to that, um, but it is part of the guidance given um, from the DHHS and the governor that that's a requirement regardless of plan that we're in. And that's all well and good, but we know that there are some people out there who have an attitude about wearing masks. They think they don't have to, and they're telling their children they don't have to. What are you going to do? Besides, talk to mama. <laughs> we'll do it. Well, we'll do our best to engage in a meaningful conversation with those families because we want everybody to um, to be fully aware of the of the consequences and the ways that we can drive down our case rate in Mecklenburg County. Um, and the number one thing is to wear face covering. So we certainly will do our best to to message that in a way that's collaborative. <laughs> That's very diplomatic. It's <laughs> <laughs> not getting to where I'm at. Oh, we let her call. <laughs> All right. My, my other question is, uh, Dr. Hayes, you've mentioned 50% a couple of times in terms of the A versus the B, and it feels like it's half and half because A gets as, just as much time as B gets. But um, when we were doing the three weeks, A, B, and C, that got our students in the school building about a third of the time, which is 33 and a third percent. Uh, now they're getting two days in and three days out. That's 40 percent. 50 percent would be one week in, one week out, one week in, one week out. So I just wanted to be a bit more uh, precise in terms of what percent we are talking about when we're talking about our students in school. Yes, ma'am. When we, when we refer to the 50 percent, what we're referring to is the actual total student population of the district, meaning that it's at 50 percent. Yes, ma'am. Right. But it's yes. not 50 percent of the kids getting 50 percent of the time in the classroom. No, ma'am. Not at this point in time. That is that is accurate because we, we feel that utilizing that Wednesday um, because one of the things that our teachers lifted up to us uh, in meetings with them was the, the fact of being able to meet with small groups, meet with individual groups of students, uh, meet for planning uh, in PLC work that needs to be done to make sure that they are executing at the, at, you know, the way they want to execute on uh, as far as instructional uh, in their lessons. And so we feel that uh, it is appropriate to allow them to to be able to utilize that time and also our students. Um, we also see the, the Wednesday as an opportunity for students to potentially um, have asynchronous work that maybe not on the computer, uh, you know, that's that's maybe project-based or something that's that's in the home. So, uh, you know, we'll, sh we'll share that and, and look to our principals and our teachers and, and our learning and teaching team to help guide that work uh, as, as other opportunities other than just being at the computer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ms. Marshall. Um, thank you. Thank you for this. I um, want to sort of look at the relationship of the schedule now between elementary and middle because obviously that is, uh, that's where we are right now. We have sort of two different cadences, as you would say, uh, to this. And um, I know that for the, for the public, and I've gotten lots of emails on why we couldn't go to this model in the first place. And I've indicated to folks that it really has to do with a number of our schools that have more students than we could do in a six foot spacing, which is the requirements that we have now. So can you speak to sort of how you're looking at uh, how we're gonna approach that and what we might do if we got additional information? Yes, yes ma'am. So one of the key factors there is that um, 
there was multiple leave acts that were passed and opportunities for staff and uh, due to family situations, health situations, and so forth. Uh, when we first brought the fir first plan forward on the 16th, uh, and we did not have an accurate number um, of what that would possibly look like uh, moving forward. We definitely didn't have that back in June when we were first bringing the original plan to the table. Uh, we have a lot, uh, the numbers on there are much clearer for us now as, as part of, they're also included in the metrics that we have that we'll be monitoring on a weekly basis. Uh, and so that's, that's key for us. Um, you gotta have, you gotta have staff inside the school building. And, and you bring up a great, because uh, I, I want to bring uh, point this out because a lot of people feel like, well, if somebody's out on leave, we'll just hire a new teacher. Well, people have rights, and those and the rights that come with that job and with leave is that that position still needs to be there when they return. So we are unable to actually hire a teacher for that position when someone is out on leave, and that has to that would have to be a long term sub. Uh, so by making sure that we are responsible in how we respond to, to returning back to an in-person uh, opportunity. Uh, we hope to minimize uh, that, uh, that, that uh, concern that many of our faculty and staff may have. Uh, so they'll stay in there with us uh, and, and, and they'll meet the students uh, through this progression uh, to then get back in, in, into what we would consider what would be called a plan A where everyone's back in the building together. Well, in terms of, and, and that's that's just that's good information. The the fact that we've got an A, you know, an A B plan for our elementary, and then a, a different A B C plan for middle. So that's going to be that could be problematic for families. I, I would hope that, frankly, if we got some information like we got from the governor a few weeks ago, we might look at how to make the middle school go to an a b is that something we could flip to quickly is that a possibility without panicking every single middle school so, principal out there <laughs> and what i'm getting ready to respond to but uh, yes ma'am i you know and i think if we if like i said once again if we talk to our building leaders uh, i think that um you know they're having to work within the restrictions that are provided by the state uh, if those restrictions change uh, then we may have an opportunity to also look at the the grouping of those students as well uh, and the impact of that, because like I said earlier, for us to look at an A, an A B scenario uh, with a frequency of each week, two weeks, to combine that together is a little bit easier than it is to do a third and a third and a third over a three week time period. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we definitely would re we would revisit that, but we would also revisit that with consultation of our middle school principals as well, just like we did with our elementary. Certainly, I, you know, I just I think I, I I like the increase in frequency for sure. I think that's the right step to go forward. So I think anytime we could. Increase incorporate that I would really like to see that like go forward but I understand where we are right now we don't have that capability so therefore we have two different schedules um, at this point let me ask this um, the um, ASAP uh, that we mentioned earlier the after school enrichment program that is a before school or after school so for for students that for instance, I have a student in the A group, and they go Monday and Tuesday. They would be able to go before school and after school in ASAP. Yes, ma'am. They could also opt to have a Wednesday day in ASAP as well, correct? That is, that is correct. They actually uh, they have a pre preferential seating that is that they will be able to attain first, and then uh, if there's open seats after that, we will be able to then uh, address other students that would want to get in. Okay. Now, those students that are then, so they're A, so then on Thursday, Friday, they'd be at home. They would not have that opportunity with ASAP. They would need to be at home because I'm assuming those classrooms are utilized by students in the regular rotations. Am I correct? I may have, I probably added too much in that question. So let me just, I'll try and, I'll try and streamline that a little bit, sorry. Um, um, so, so a student in A has the opportunity to go after school, for instance, on Monday, Tuesday, and be in the building for an ASAP day on Wednesday, but they need to be home Thursday and Friday. They do not have the opportunity to stay there Thursday and Friday. Is that correct? Uh, can you take the mic? Just... Yes. So you're asking, can the A, B students use ASAP on Thursday? On can the yeah, Monday, Tuesday students use ASAP on Thursday, Friday? Yeah. 
I, I, I definitely want to uh, make sure I'm correct in what I'm saying, but I, I believe my the, my understanding was that ASEP and BSEP are available for students on their rotation um, and on the remote day. So if they are not in a, the a day in person day, right. minus the Wednesday. Oh, you got it. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, uh, no, 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 no. And, and listen, and, and, uh, the, the beauty of technology, right? So uh, Mr. Brian Casey, I told him he didn't have to be here this evening. He's been working on this uh, relentlessly as we've been going through the process, uh, also with many of our community partners as well. So uh, he is, because he, I want to make sure that when we make statements about certain things that are like this, that are drastically impacting families that we don't give wrong information. So what is very clear in, uh, from him is it is possible if there is room in the afternoons, uh, space and availability will be dictated uh, for um, after school only, not all day. Okay. okay. Yes, ma'am. All right. All right. So um, I think a big question that I would have had whether we did the third, a third, a third rotation or this is to let families know what we think instruction might look like when folks are at home and half the classroom is there in the building. So um, that's my last question, and I know we've, we've sort of spoken about that. I just think that would, that's sort of, that's an interesting thing that we would, have, we would encounter regardless, but let's just talk about what it looks like now. Yes, ma'am. So uh, there's a couple of couple of different ways that that's working right now. Um, as we share with some of the schools, and let me make sure I'm correct. Is what would what would that look like as they're transitioning between those days? Okay. So um, some of our schools, and uh, as we were looking at, I apologize. Let me just. Oh yeah, that's right. You did that. So, for example, like here, so you look at like Governor's Village, each grade level assigned a uh, dedicated uh, full remote academy teacher. Remaining teachers are uh, paired such that one is teaching in person and another one is teaching the remote students. So they've paired them up. You have others where um, all of the teachers, you have the full remote, and then you have all the other teachers that are at that grade level that are spread out teaching the remaining number of students that are there. So um, there's a variety of ways in which that looks, but I think um, the, the consistency here that we want to make sure that students are experiencing one or two of the same teachers in the process of transitioning between the two remains consistent, and that's what they're going to be working on over the next couple of weeks to, to make okay. sure that they're able to so develop. So it sounds like we've got, we've got some variation among the buildings, and my guess is, too, once people figure all this out, there's going to be yet more variation. So, again... We want to minimize um, any transitions between teachers, but know that that could happen. But again, that's the goal is to not have that happen. It could, but uh, uh, Trish Sexton, who is one of our equity superintendents, uh, had the opportunity after uh, we had some preliminary numbers kind of coming forward and everything else, what it might look like in collapsing C into A and B, uh, was able to reach out to some of our principals and, and speak to them. And, and, and that's what I, I, I was speaking to, is that I want our, our community to understand, and uh, definitely our principals, that we hear them and that to the best of their ability, they're going to try to maintain that relationship. But there, we also want to say the cautionary tale is, is that when extreme circumstances come up, we're going to have we may that may have to be an outcome that that we have to move on. Uh, but it will be something that will be really at a last resort rather than something that's seen as the first move in action. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Sawyer, I don't have any questions. No thank questions you. at this time. All right. Um, well, then, um, if everyone has had a chance to ask their questions. Um, I'm going to turn to you, Ms. Sawyer, to make the motion. Sean, Sean you said you were going to go back to Sean. He finished. finished. Oh, he finished. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Madam Chair, I move to approve the modifications to the previously approved CMS transition plan for in-person and remote instruction, Plan B, and the adoption of the school calendar entitled Revised K-5 Plan B, as recommended by the superintendent. My motion includes the following. K-5 will be divided into two groups instead of the previously approved three groups. The first group for K-5, Group A, will attend in-person instruction every Monday and Tuesday that are instructional days per the school calendar beginning on November 2nd, 2020. The second grouping for K-5, Group B, 
will attend in-person instruction every Thursday and Friday that are instructional days per the school calendar beginning on November 2nd, 2020. Every Wednesday that is an instructional day will be a remote learning day for all K-5 students. The previously approved plan for grades six through 12 remains unchanged. This plan will adhere to the guidelines of the remote learning plan previously approved by this board on July 15th, 2020. All right, do we have a second? Second. Okay, we've got a motion on the floor from Ms. Sawyer, a second from Ms. De La Hara. Ms. Sawyer, would you like to speak to your motion? Yes, thank you. I am pleased to support this plan. I think it offers our elementary students uh, more touch points with their teachers while not sacrificing um, safety by abandoning social distancing. We've had, we will make some adjustments in social distancing in some classrooms and in some settings, but for the most part, our students will have the space to be in classrooms and move around the building safely and not be, um, we will not have classrooms of, of 25 children. You know, we'll imagine, you know, half classroom sizes in a standard classroom building, standard classroom size. And this plan responds to our community health metrics, which are in the yellow. We have 66 cases per 100,000. Um, our yellow band is between 10 and 100 cases. So we're kind of high, high in the yellow band on that. Our case positive at 6.5 is, is still in the yellow, which we had designated as between five and 10% test positive rate. So I think it's important that we consider that health data and use that to guide our planning. And I think this plan uh, takes advantage of being able to have a little wiggle room in hard counts on students while paying close attention to safety. Thank you. All right, thank you. So I'm gonna to go to our board members who are joining us electronically next. Um, Dr. Jones, do you um, have any um, points that you wanna make during discussion and debate? She's still on mute. Okay. Unmute. There you are. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am, we hear you. Okay, I just wanna say thank you to the staff and the great deal of work put into a plan to educate our children in a manner which looks at a whole district perspective, uh, considering communities that are high risk, uh, prudent decisions, uh, and course of action. Uh, we still have areas of concern, um, uh, such as co needed um, additional custodial services, um, uh, bus drivers, uh, teacher shortage, and possibly even um, cafeteria workers. So I think given that of those aspects um, of shortages and the unknowns that we are moving in a way that, again, I say is, is wise and prudent. So thank you. All right, Ms. Cheek. Yes, yeah, so I am happy that we have moved forward. This is six days every three weeks versus five. It is an improvement. The children are gonna be in the schools weekly so that the glitches and things can be worked out. I am disappointed that it does not go farther and that it does not start sooner, but I'm not gonna let that disappointment keep me from supporting it this evening. I just request, as I said in my questions, that we continue to watch the metrics weekly 
that when we do see trends that are good, that we acknowledge that the best place that children can be is in the classroom, as long as it is safe, and that we get them back into the classroom as soon as possible. And I wanna tell this community, I'm hearing your messages, I'm receiving all your emails, and I feel the angst that all the parents have that want their kids back in the classroom. I am speaking for you now and saying that we need to work on getting that to happen. I especially urge our staff, as metrics start to make incremental improvements, that we consider as soon as possible bringing our kindergarten, first and second grade, as some of our board members used to call them the babies, the little ones, that we bring those little ones back into our schools for in-person instruction. They are the ones that are suffering the most by not being in person. They are the ones that remote instruction, I believe, is the least successful for. And they are the ones that are our future. And if we do not intervene on them as soon as we can, we are going to see poor third grade reading scores. And as some of my former colleagues always said that if you can't read in third grade, that's, that's a pipeline to prison. That was Eric Ellis Stewart and Richard McElrath, and I'm gonna quote them now. We've got to intervene on the K-2 kids as soon as it is safe to bring them back in the classrooms. Um, but other than that, I will support this motion. All right, thank you. Ms. Ship. Yes, um, I wanna thank uh, the district for all the work that you have done to get us to this point where we're re-looking at a plan that is gonna be a better plan in terms of instruction and teaching, being an elementary former principal and actually a teacher. I know the work that is taken. I know there's a lot to be done. I'm glad we are here uh, and we're gonna be able to do this work to get, as you know, Ms. Cheek has said and, and even um, Dr. Jones, it is critical that we know our little ones <laughs> need to be in the building as soon as possible in-person learning. The screen time is incredibly hard for them. And so I'm glad we're looking at these, these weeks and also looking at the caution and safety as we look at these kids having to wear masks as they get on the bus. And we know there's a lot of moving parts. So I know that has a lot to do with the calendar and the scheduling. Um, I do know it's important to get them in the building as soon as possible, but I do know the work that must be done to get them there. Um, so again, I'm kind of like, yes, this is a good plan. It's a good start. I want to continue to monitor where we are. So if we can go forward sooner, or if we had to move back, we're prepared to do it. And so as we're talking tonight to the staff, to the public, we're talking about being prepared, beginning to have the mindset of preparedness so we can begin to move as quickly as we need to as we look at these majors, especially once we get in person with our pre-K and our K-5. I didn't say before, but I'm, I'm concerned also about the schedule we have for our middle school and high school students um, because they need it too. They need to be in the building. And I know we're not quite there yet, but I think we need to also be looking at that schedule. Uh, in November, that's right around Thanksgiving. I've had some um, comments about that. So I hope that we can continue to monitor this and look at where we are so we can move all children. They need in-person learning. And I know this, you know, being an instructor of, of students all the way up through high school, and an administrator. So again, thank you for this work. I'm in favor definitely of this because I know it's good. We need that Wednesday in there. I think that would be a great piece for our teachers and our students. So thank you for this work. Um, but from starting with the superintendent all the way through our executive staff and our administrators and our teachers and support staff, thank you for the work that I know you will embark on and deliver on. So. Um, Thank you. All right. Mr. Shul, is there anything you want us to keep in mind before we vote? Yeah. Um, so I, I do support this plan, and I, I think it's well thought out, and I think it does account for the safety of students. Um, 
But what I would like to offer as a point of reflection for this board is whether this situation becomes a precedent for how we act in the future. Um, because as someone rightly pointed out earlier, our deliberation is based off of the county metrics and not the states. And as the superintendent pointed out even further, it's based off of things specific to CMS and factors specific to our district. Um, and by that logic, state decisions shouldn't pre predetermine our boards. Um, because the fact is that when we're talking about our, our risk benefit calculus, our risk could, could very well be a life. Um, and no doubt that's being readily dismissed as some sappy emotional appeal, but, but that is a reality. In Mississippi and in South Carolina, it has been a reality. Um, and the county health metrics that we're using are by no means arbitrary. I think they're well-grounded, well-recommended by medical professionals, including by Dr. Redfield of the CDC. Um, so when we're looking to a decision specifically about whether to send 6th through 8 or 9 through 12 back, I think we have to remember things like that kids 10 through 19 are specifically more susceptible to spreading this virus. Um, and if the state of colleges across our nation are any indications that, unfortunate as it might be, we can't have that much trust in my peers, right? Um, and that's, to make this, um, to sum it up, I think that if we do have a state decision coming out talking about 6 through 8 or 9 through 12, we should take that with serious deliberation and we shouldn't let this situation determine how that one might end up. Hey, Mr. Strain, you're up. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I want to thank uh, Ms. Cheek for her eloquent words earlier. Um, couldn't have said that any better. I, too, will support this. 20% increase in in-school instruction time for our K-5 students, although 200% was on the table. Um, and uh, certainly the in-school instruction every week is tremendously valuable to those students, and I appreciate you making the move in that direction. I, too, want to call for acceleration of the middle school and high school schedules. Um, I, I'd, I'd love to understand the, the, the phasing because there isn't phasing into a school, it's phasing between schools. We've discussed that there's no real value in the phasing between schools. If there is going to be phasing and there's a case to be made, then perhaps a week, not three weeks. Uh, the, the governor, um, you know, is, is clearing the state to move into phase three and fully open the state within the phase three um, regulations and rules. And it's still three and a half months before many of our high school kids will see the in, inside of a classroom for instruction. So I think we owe it to them to uh, think hard about this, sharpen our pencils, and get them back in school. Thanks. Ms. Delahara. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I am going to support this plan tonight. Um, because it's allowing parents, and I do think it's important that we reiterate this, who are choosing to have their children in the school buildings uh, more touch points. Uh, sometimes I, I feel from the public that, that we've forgotten that we do have that offering of the full remote academy um, that was offered. And so again, this is allowing the parents who have chosen that they want their kids in the physical school buildings to have more touch points for all the reasons that you articulated, Dr. Hayes. I, I appreciate that. Um, but we are in the yellow, as, as we pointed out tonight. And so I also like the balance of how this provides us um, the opportunity um, to, uh, to the greatest degree possible to maintain the social distancing. And I appreciate your multiple commitment to uh, the statement that we are that wearing a mask is absolutely mandatory, and so that gives me um, gives me confidence. You know, um, I get a lot of emails, and I know I haven't responded to many as of late because they are backing up. <laughs> a lot of emails with various varying opinions, I should say, and it's just a reflection of where we are in our community and in our state and our country. And I guess I just want to take a moment to kind of acknowledge that because in one sense I get a emails, you know, kind of saying, get those kids back in school. And, and I understand why parents feel that way. Um, which by the way, I want to say, you know, I'm, I'm only agreeing to from previous votes that we do go back to school because you have assured me that we are ready. 
you meaning staff, I'm looking at superintendent and to you folks over there. That, and that is from multiple meetings where we've shared all of our great strides. And so um, it gives me confidence that we can move in that direction. I know we're not all trained that tonight, but I just wanna reiterate that. On the other hand, I get emails, you know, kind of saying, don't do it, don't go back at all, don't increase any frequency, <laughs> because people are simultaneously scared about community spread. And today I even got, uh, I read an AP article, Associated Press article that was sent to me, that um, uh, uh, cases for children are now make up 10% in the nation. Not necessarily our state and certainly not our county, but in the nation, in April they were 2%. Presumably because kids are now going back to school. <laughs> and I don't say that to like caution us unnecessarily, but it just, it just shows how I guess I'm just trying to help the public be prepared because I'm not convinced yet that we may not have to come back and close this whole thing down. And that's not what I want. I'm not advocating for that. I would love for us to wear our mask, do what we're supposed to do, <laughs> and move back into the schools. But I think it's important that we continue to put that out there to call our public um, to that responsibility because uh, we will do everything that we can with the great resources and the work that you all have done to keep our children and our employees and our staff safe. But we just need to be mindful of that um, so that we don't lose sight of that and continue to be flexible in understanding the great stress that our whole school district has been under as we have are simultaneously creating and improving our virtual learning environment while coming up with all of our plan B uh, plans to come back and that's a lot of work and I thank you all for it Ms. Bayers Bailey thank you um, I really am uh, I can't say I'm excited about this plan because I think ultimately we want our children in schools I get all of the same emails that we the rest of us have been getting regarding my need my child back in school they're not thriving they're upset they're depressed um, they, you know, they just don't want to even go to the computer anymore. I, I, you know, and I get them, and I, it, it touches my heart. And I know the parents are sincere. The children need, they need to be there. But we also need the children to be safe. And the, the thing that gave me pause about this plan was the fact that we were backing off of the social separation. And that the, that the masks plus the social separation was what gave me comfort in our original plan. That we were gonna, to the best, I know children are gonna get next to each other. And nothing is gonna be, per, and then, you know, the, even if they're wearing the mask, it falls off, you know, and then they have to put it back on. There is no perfect scenario that's gonna keep everyone safe, but to give up on the social separation was the risk benefit that we talked about here tonight about it's the benefit of having our students back in the classroom seeing their teachers seeing their friends is worth giving up some of the separation that we're having to give up in order to get all of them back in school and so i'm willing to live with that and pray. Ms. Marshall? I appreciate, too, the willingness to take the governor's uh, options and, and look at what flexibilities that gives us. I know this is not exactly where a lot of people would like to be right now, and I would definitely like us to be posturing and facing towards A as fast as we can. Uh, but I understand that there are uh, there are things we have to consider along the way to do that. So, so I appreciate this posture. I have always liked this plan. I know other districts in the state have used have utilized this, and I think that it it sort of combines the best of both. And certainly, those students, those elementary students in the C group that weren't going to see the inside of a classroom until November the 16th. They're going to get to see it the week of November the 2nd, so I think that's a win. I certainly would love for everything to be moved up, but I do understand where, where we are right now with staff, and I think that 
again, moving, moving this uh, to this plan really moves up our elementary entry anyway, and I'm, I'm pleased with that. Um, I think that as we go forward, you know, while we talk about case rates and positivity rates, we also understand that elementary school students have been proven, while they, they certainly can contract the disease, that, that is, it is a different experience for them and we're not completely sure how, how much they are able to infect other children. So we're going to be watching some schools that are going to go ahead into A uh, right around us and, and folks that are experiencing uh, rates of positivity and case rates just like us. So we're going to have some things to look at. And I would encourage us to really isolate these, these the itty bitties too, and look at where we are in terms of K-5, how other people are faring, because I do think that's very important information. And we may be able to utilize that to, to move us in that direction faster. So again, I appreciate the posture. I think that's this is where we need to be. I would encourage us to be able to be flexible and look at that and and and, and dig down into those numbers a little bit more rather than just a larger positivity rate. Because I think a 25-year-old who's um, experiencing life in South End is very different from a five-year-old. So I think that we, we need to be able to separate that a bit. Um, I also uh, want to say that I've read, you know, why is CMS changing all the time? Well, there's new information that comes available and I'm, I'm not going to apologize for adapting and, and asking staff to look at that new information and act on it. So you may see us again. Um, and I think that any time we can make these plans look alike uh, is better for families. I am very interested in seeing if we can get to a six, uh, grade six through eight, A day, B day type thing. Uh, and I'm crossing my fingers we can get there. Uh, but we will, we will continue to do that. Again, apologies to my middle school principal friends who probably are throwing their hands up right now. But um, again, that's what this, that's what this uh, season is all about. It's about change. And so one other thing, two other things I want to leave us with in terms of getting here faster and staying open once we open is really going to depend on how our community deals with the flu, I think. And so uh, I'm going to go next week and get my flu shot. I think a number of folks here already have gotten theirs. Uh, I, I see no reason why any adult who cares about kids, who cares about our communities, is not getting a flu shot this year. I'm just going to put it out there. And I need your children to get it too, because this is really going to make a difference in how we stay open. Uh, it's a personal responsibility that everybody has this year. So um, I, I'm just, I, th I think it's super important. Another quick thing, I'm going to do a little commercial here for subs. I haven't talked about this before, uh, but for anybody who's interested in subbing for CMS, we would love to be talking to you right now because, you know, we, we need to make sure our teachers are safe and they're going to every now and then be sick too for the flu or a cold or whatever. So we, we need some help there. And I would love for the community to look at that and say, that's something I could do. And, and I would really appreciate folks delving into that. So I've said enough. I'm supportive of this, and I really do appreciate staff's willingness our, uh, to, to do this on all levels. And thank you again to teachers who just working like crazy to do the right things for kids. Okay. All right. Thank you, Ms. Marshall. And my son and I got our flu shots yesterday. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Flu vaccines. Um, so every time we have to make another one of these decisions. Pardon? Oh, no, no. Oh, okay, <laughs> sorry. Every time we have to make another one of these decisions, um, it weighs on me more heavily because we are responsible for the health and safety of our staff and of our students. Um, and that's a heavy responsibility. And we're also responsible for providing our students with what they need instructionally and social emotionally and that's also a heavy responsibility we have to weigh both of those and balance balance those weights um, and it's just so much to weigh um, so i thank you for super mr superintendent and your team for your hard work um, and your creative imagination and your thorough um, checking with the 
experts in the classroom and in the schoolhouse as well as the public health experts because we need all of that expertise to inform every decision that we make um, because you know we are in we are in a time where the science is still emerging and like you were saying dr hayes um, there's there's no playbook for this so we have to make our best educated guess guesses by working with as many experts as we can, informing both the instructional side and the medical side. And so I think that's, that's what you've done here. We did um, get a little bit more flexibility and some changed guidance from the governor and from DHHS, and we've adapted to that. Um, and so I support this plan as well. Um, and I guess I just, I also know that, you know, with a 6% or 6 plus percent um, rate, infection rate in the community, it is out there. And the more we bring people together, we will find out that there are teachers or custodians or students who may have this. Um, what I need to know is that our schools themselves are not contributing to spreading the disease. But I do want us all to be aware that I, I, I believe there will be cases. There are cases probably in our school community right now and we will be learning more about those cases as we bring everybody back together again. So I trust that, you know, with the plans that, that you've worked out, again, with the guidance of the county health director and her team, that we have a good way to catch those cases, isolate, quarantine, do the, you know, the, the case study, um, whatever that word is for, <laughs> um, figuring out who has been in contact. Um, and so we'll minimize spread that way. But, but um, I'm just gearing myself for, you know, for when we get that news. It has happened in private schools in our community, it has happened in surrounding districts, and so I just know we have to be responsible as as um, as we walk that road. Um, but I do support this. I think this is a good. It's we're still being cautious and responsible, but we are increasing the um, the t the time that our students are going to be together with their teachers. We're increasing the frequency of when our teachers can check in on their students, can help with the techn techn technological problems or um, give the social emotional support that, that our students sometimes rely on from our schools. And so I think you've done good work here and I thank you for that. Um, even while every <laughs> vote we have to make this year just weighs on me so heavily. Um, so. With that, I'm going to call for the vote and I will start with those of you who are joining us electronically. Dr. Jones, if you could unmute yourself and, and let me know how say you. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay, Ms. Cheek, how say you? Yes. Ms. Schitt, how say you? Yes. All right. Um, for those of us in the room, um, all those in favor, please raise your hands. And any opposed? All right, Madam Clerk, the motion passes unanimously nine to zero. So that concludes our business for this evening. I will now entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All right, motion from Ms. Byers-Bailey, second from Ms. Sawyer. All in favor, please raise your hands. Board members yes. who are participating by phone, please say yes. Yes. All right, I heard three yeses. Any opposed? Yes. <laughs> okay, seeing no opposition, we are adjourned.